You couldn't blame the men for wanting to keep women out of their unions. The problem was that men experienced women's presence in the labor force as demasculinizing. We know this because organized men who tended to be more highly skilled and better paid than the average worker did not hesitate to say so. In newspaper columns, at trade union meetings, in articles in the weekly press, working men and their representatives excoriated the numbers of women entering industry. As one working man's paper put it with some hyperbole, we shall spare no effort to check the most unnatural invasion of our firesides by which the order of nature is reversed and women, the loveliest of God's creatures, reduced to the menial conditions of savage life. Another commented, man is and should be the head of his own department. He supports the family. Women should be the head in her department, in the management of household affairs and the care and rearing of children. To entice women to go back home, men agreed that the wages of men would need to be increased. And so the idea of the family wage came into being. If men earned more, if they were manly enough to earn more, they could keep their wives at home. After all, a man was entitled to a wife to care for him. He needed a wage that was fair. Employers should be willing to pay what began to be identified as a family wage, a wage appropriate to a male breadwinner. Because women at the time generally earned wages if they lacked male support, it was thought that they required only an individual wage. At fair individual wages, women might keep body and soul together, but they could hardly be expected to support children or elderly parents and younger siblings. The demand for a family wage satisfied many middle-class women as well. After all, if a man who earned a family wage could keep his wife and children out of the labor force, everyone would win. Except, perhaps, women who still wanted and needed to earn wages.